Welcome to the EMS Interoperability Task Force for June 8th, um, where uh, on today's topic, we'll be uh, covering um, sequence and workflow for the interaction between EMS and uh, um, a health information network and a hospital. Um, this meeting is being recorded, uh, and the recording will be posted on the Nemesis YouTube channel. So if there's anything that comes up in the meeting that you need us to remove from the recording, uh, just let us know. Um, also, um, with the size of the group that we have, uh, which is fairly large, um, we're going to move to a little more moderated approach um, on this call today, see how that works out for us. So um, I would ask that uh, as we get into the discussion um, that you use the raise hand feature in Zoom uh, and uh, then I'll call on people uh, through that. Um, I wanna make sure that uh, those of you who may have had trouble uh, jumping in or, or, or cutting off someone else uh, or felt like you would be cutting off someone else, that you have the opportunity to just raise your hand and that we can get to you and, and, um, and hear your comments uh, so that we get input from everyone um, on the call who would uh, like to say something. Um, so uh, let's, um, let's kind of take a look at where we are. So we've made it through several topics so far this year. Um, and of course, last month we had um, the overview of the design of the SAFER project uh, that Mark Branning presented. Um, and I forgot to check for Mark on the call. Are you with the, let's see. Mark, are you on the call? I don't see your name right off. Okay. I don't think he's on yet. Yeah, Mark might not be on yet. Um, uh, we have um, added several uh, of the safer related resources um, in the GitHub repository. Um, so I wanna show you that um, right here. So if you go to the GitHub repository, github.com slash IHE slash EMS, uh, and then drill down to presentations folder and then the safer folder. Um, we had the technical documentation there. We've made a little update to that. And then we've pushed, uh, posted several other uh, resources uh, related to the SAFER project that you're welcome to uh, take a look at, various uh, artifacts from that project. So feel free to take a look at those. And uh, Amit has posted that uh, link to the GitHub repo in the chat. Okay, so uh, today we'll focus on uh, sequence and workflow. Uh, then of course, we've still got future topics uh, as we dive deeper into healthcare data standards um, to, to use in uh, these exchanges that happen between EMS and the rest of healthcare. Uh, and then you know, eventually into even more details about which data elements to parse and share. And, um, and then finally, patient identification and matching. Um, so topics still to come. Uh, I want to give you a quick reminder up front here about the NEMSIS annual meeting, August 23rd to 24th near Park City, Utah, uh, with the pre-conference session on Tuesday, August 22nd from noon to 4 p.m. that will be the interoperability workshop for EMS vendors. Uh, lunch will be provided um, at about 11.30 uh, prior to the start of that session. Uh, so we would encourage uh, those of you who are planning on attending the annual meeting to go ahead and uh, register for this pre-conference session as well. Um, we will have an HL7 and FHIR 101 uh, presentation during that session, during that workshop, and then really take uh, time to identify what we've learned and documented so far about EMS interoperability, you know, lots of like what we've covered through these task force calls, um, and then look forward to uh, how to participate in the IHE Connectathon and the HIMSS 2024 Interoperability Showcase. So looking ahead and making sure we can get great uh, EMS um, data participation in um, those future events. So that's the Interoperability uh, Workshop um, coming up in connection with the NEMSIS Annual Meeting. Um, does anyone have any uh, uh, questions about what we'll be covering in that workshop or how to register or any of that? Okay, great. Let me get my participant list here in case someone raises their hand. I need to be able to see. Okay. And okay, I, cool. So, oh, go I was ahead. Gonna say, I do notice uh, uh, Mark has joined and I uh, just wanted to say hello and uh, just mention to Mark that we had uh, um, posted some of the additional safer resources on our GitHub repo. 
and the, the links are up there on our chat. Yeah, welcome, Mark. Um, we had just briefly uh, covered um, that these additional resources are available. Is there anything, Mark, that you would like to add about uh, um, what we've uh, posted here? Just that if they need to call me or email, that's just fine. I can answer some of the questions. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to dive into today's topic. Um, so we're going to be looking at the sequence and workflow for an emergency transport to a hospital. This is uh, referred to as the paramedicine care flow diagram. So this is an EMS uh, unit going on a 911 call, uh, treating a patient, taking them to a hospital, and looking at the various data interactions that are going to happen uh, throughout that workflow. And so the question we're trying to answer today uh, really is how can we refine that workflow diagram uh, to best represent um, you know, what's going to be the ideal sequence of interactions on that EMS call? And uh, any refinements we need to make to that diagram to uh, uh, you know, indicate which data standards, profiles, et cetera, that it uh, should reference so that everyone has a good um, uh, you know, kind of a one place to go to look at that workflow diagram and say, okay, here's the stuff I need to implement uh, in order to make these exchanges happen. Um, so we're gonna be looking at this uh, diagram here. I've got the link here and um, we need to get that into the chat, so. Got it up there. You got it? Okay, great, thanks Amit. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and, and go to um, that diagram and that's where we're gonna spend the day. Uh, the time this morning. Okay, so um, we have John Murky on the call with us. Um, we were chatting just before the call uh, and um, he's having some uh, possible connectivity issues, but he should be with us uh, consistently, we hope. And um, so John uh, is the one who originally uh, built this uh, paramedicine care flow diagram. And uh, Clay Mann and I reviewed it um, last year, probably about six months ago. Um, we made a few minor tweaks to it. I think um, over the past few months, uh, as I've learned more about the interactions uh, that would occur um, on an EMS call with a health information exchange or a hospital, um, I think I've seen a, a few areas where we might potentially uh, flesh this out some more. And so I'm really interested in um, the input that all of you will have. So um, there's a basic high level diagram here at the top and then a more detailed one down below. We'll spend most of our time in the detailed one, um, but you know, here's the basic um, workflow at the high level. Uh, we have the ambulance going on a call. They're looking up a patient um, they're trying to find medical summaries for that patient, using that medical information as they treat the patient, and then pushing their patient care report to a hospital. And then eventually getting a discharge summary from the hospital uh, that would have um, the diagnosis and discharge disposition of that patient. Uh, finally, then getting that uh, outcome information uh, integrated into their NEMSIS uh, export of their patient care reports so that when they send that NEMSIS XML file to uh, their state, that it includes those hospital outcomes. So that's the high level view. Um, we're going to go ahead and dig into the details now uh, with this more detailed flow. And um, so let's start in here. And then uh, this is where I want to get your input as we go along and see um, you know, what we might be able to do to, uh, to make any changes to this diagram that would uh, be helpful to all of you. So um, we start out with the ambulance, uh, trying to, to look up a patient in a health information exchange. Um, one question I have here is, um, it could be an HIE, like a state or regional HIE. It could be a national network. Um, is, does it matter to you if we call this a HIE or if we call it a health information network? Um, any of that, any, any comments on that? Are you just asking generally whether folks have an opinion on the matter? <laughs> right, yeah. Uh, are, 
is does this sound limiting to to suggest that only an HIE quote unquote could uh, be involved in this interaction, or should we use a more general term? Um, and Mario? I see uh, Mario has his uh, hand up. Uh, Mario. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. I was going to say it's you know we should be pretty broad and maybe just an or statement there. Or, or maybe in maybe a statement that is footnoted later, what it means, like this thing, whether it's a network or um, I think uh, I think HIE tends to use like content source or data source, something source, and then we can just footnote that a source could be a regional Rio, it could be a national network like Care Quality, or you know there might be other even other places. Great, thank you. I believe, and maybe a mid knows, but I believe uh, IHG uses something like source. There's a lot of diversity of services in the health information exchange uh, ecosystem now. And, you know, like not all health information exchanges are set up the same. But I think you're generally referring to the state um, designated entity who performs that uh, clinical health information exchange data. Like in our state, for example, we have the clearinghouse and the clinical health information exchange in the same state. So, but I believe that that generally means um, whoever the vendor is that handles those tasks. I know in other states, it's, it's certain other organizations. You know, it varies from state to state. Yeah, and as, um, as Mario just mentioned, it could be a national network. Uh, that's the possibility too. Now, this is John Marquis. I'll, I'll throw in just a little bit of color here. Um, I like that, that you're, you're trying to, to figure out whether the term is, is being too restrictive. But I'll also point, um, there is an, an even deeper uh, version of this um, on, on one of the other pages where I express that the, the concept of patient discovery, there's three uh, variations on that depending on whether you are using FHIR uh, whether you are uh, in an XDS, a, sim a single domain, or whether you're trying to use a uh, cross-community, a nationwide, nationwide exchange. The three of them are very, very similar, um, but they are technically different. So I, I didn't want to, you know, didn't want to add that complexity to this diagram, um, but Certainly, that is in in one of the other diagrams that's in here. Is that you know it, it, it might be dependent on the, the the technology, but ultimately it's a patient discovery. You send in the the attributes that you know, and you get back the best match uh, available. Okay, that rings a bell, and I forgot where those additional details were. Do you know offhand? Uh -huh. From this yeah, slide. up under document sharing under the purple, the purple bar there at the top is a document sharing. So it's there okay. under consume. Under consuming. Yeah. So. Okay. Patient, yeah. XCPD, yeah. U or uh, PMR. So. Okay. Great. And again, these are the, so, I mean, this is a good chance to, to go to one of the other points you had made. Um, ultimately, it'd be great if one could be chosen so that you don't have to say, well, gee, are you this, this, or this flavor? Um, I did not have anything to gauge what would be the architectural choice, so I put in the alternatives. And, and that's done throughout here. Um, but you know, if you know that you're always going to be using um, the nationwide exchange, well, then this simplifies to just use XCPD, and you're done. Um, so you know, those are some things that that certainly can be done. Um, 
choosing to always go to the nationwide exchange um, not only you know simplifies okay well i'll definitely use xcpd but it also means you'll find the patient's information wherever it may be scattered throughout the nation um, you know the the patient might be visiting from somewhere else where the most recent summary is not in your local state so that's one of the advantages of of choosing to use you know uh, Commonwealth or Care Quality or, or e Health Exchange, in that you 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 will discover uh, the patient uh, all of their locations. Okay, um, so yeah, so what you're talking about then is we've got this whole uh, collection of possibilities for how we might interact with a network to do patient discovery, yep. and depending on what type of network that is, a, a national network versus an HIE or, or something else. So, okay. Great, thank you. Um, Jonathan? Hey, uh, all right. <laughs> um, so yeah, just briefly, your question had been about the words. Um, I just wanted to point out two things. First of all, not my understanding that not every state has that statewide designated entity, um, mm -hmm. you know, California never does anything wrong. So, you know, just look to us as a model for everybody. We have like 13 of things. Um, so uh, that, that's one thing. I, my understanding just at a, a cursory level has been that um, HIO has tended to be the people involved in the system, uh, sort of the organization. So I think Mario mentioned Rio or, you know, HIO it tends to be the, the, the the structure that engages the market. The HIE is sort of more technical, um, sort of a, a piece of software or whatever. And the HIN um, is sort of a meta layer of those. Uh, so where you have you know, multiple regional things or uh, you know, lots and lots of different participants. So they, they tend to not, they're, they're synonymous, but not the same. Um, I, I do certainly like, I, I personally, Speaking of California, I like what they're doing here in terms of the, the state data exchange framework. Um, I think we, we have had, uh, certainly in this market space, confusion. Uh, for example, our system we refer to as a pre-hospital HIE. Uh, ESO, of course, refers to a health data exchange. Um, so I think th those names have to some degree been co-opted uh, by organizations. I think that that can lead to confusion. We've seen uh, we've actually called out RFPs that have used a brand name, not realizing it was a brand name. And I think that's where the, the use of those brands can work in some people's favor. Uh, so it's not accidental that they choose the names they do. Uh, but in this case, I would, I would probably use something more generic, like a data exchange framework, uh, data sharing framework, if we want to be a little less jargony, um, just because that's what happens, right? So rather than call it a thing, this is the scaffolding. It's the infrastructure. You can sort of use a generic term in that way where the main purpose is data sharing and, and uh, discovery. I mean, really, that's what we're talking about. So uh, unless you have a reason to use the term of art, I would tend to focus more on the what it does because that way everybody can call it what they want in their own community um, and not, uh, not have to worry about stepping on, on trademarks or... Uh, you know, what they call an HIO in this state and they call an HIO in that state, we wonder whether those are different. And it may just be that they, the legislature chose whatever word was in vogue at the time. Yeah, great. Thank you. Okay, so let's, um, let's keep going here. Um, so look up the patient uh, with whatever details you have. We, we are going to have a future task force topic on patient matching and, and how to make um, that work. So in this particular sequence diagram, I want us to kind of make the assumption that um, we have some amount of information about this patient. We're going to try to find them uh, in the network and look for a medical summary. Um, so John has indicated the query type there, uh, probably an on-demand document entry to uh, get a list of possible medical summaries from the network. Um, and then for the, the software, the ambulance company's software to, to figure out from that list of summaries, 
which ones does it want to try to retrieve, you know, based on most recent or, or most uh, relevant to the EMS call. Um, let's see, let's, let's talk about um, these medical summaries. They can be in various formats. And um, one of the, the requests that we got um, prior to the call today was to make sure we clarify a little bit um, some of these acronyms that are used here um, for these medical summaries. And so uh, one of the common things that, come up, that comes up is people will kind of interchangeably use CCD, which is continuity of care document, uh, CDA, which is clinical document architecture, and CCDA, which is Consolidated Clinical Document Architecture. Um, and uh, we wanna make sure that people understand what those are, how they are related, where they overlap um, and, and where they're different. Um, so my basic understanding is that a, a continuity of care document is, is a concept for a document that summarizes the care that's been given to a patient. It's not a record of a specific event, but rather a summary of um, care given to that patient over time by a provider. And that conceptually continuity of care document is something that even existed back in the paper world before electronic data exchange. Um, so it was saying here, here's what should be in the document, regardless of whether it's on paper or electronic or whatever else, um, it's, it's summarizing care given to a patient. Uh, clinical document architecture being um, an actual uh, set of standards from the HL7 standards body in HL7 version three. So an XML based architecture for uh, creating clinical documents. Those clinical documents may be um, continuity of care documents. They might be discharge summaries. There's, there's a whole list of different documents that could be created using that architecture. So using a particular XML um, approach to make documents. And then consolidated clinical document architecture was an effort uh, by the federal government to say, okay, we've got lots of documents out there all using clinical document architecture. We need to pick a few. And they picked, I think it was 11 um, documents to, to kind of standardize and profile uh, to say, okay, these documents within the clinical document architecture, you know, each of these is going to look this way and have these constraints. And one of those was uh, a constraining of the continuity of care document. That's my understanding of it so far. Um, Mark, you have your hand up? Sure. Um, for a practical matter, when we did SAFER, we interviewed paramedics beforehand to double check exactly what data was most meaningful to them. We checked it during the implementation, and then at the end, we checked it. And the uh, five elements that came up were, and these are current active lists. That's very important, not mm -hmm. historical, chronological, everything in the world. They wanted a mm -hmm. current problem list, current med list, current allergy list. Mm -hmm. And they want the demographics, which is where the patient has been in their region recently to help them determine where they want to uh, send the patient if they can. And then the other thing, they wanted a pulse form. It's known by different things in different states, but it's the uh, physician's order for life-sustaining treatment. And that's basically what a lot of people know is a DNR, mm -hmm. but it also means not DNR. So it's, <laughs> it's, it's both of those. Those are the five things. What they, what those regions that, were not successful in parsing out data and sent a lot of data. Number one, it made the query slow. And number two, the paramedics were overwhelmed and it didn't help them. They were spending too much time going through data. They do not want to go through data. They want it there. And just, I'm a little ahead of myself, but just since I have the floor here, mm -hmm. once they get the data, they want to be able to decide how to load that into their EPCR. Uh, usually they default and load the whole problem list in. The medications, they don't load the whole problem or uh, medications, they don't load the whole thing. In. They walk that through with the patient if they're conscious or, or with the family or try and decide. Allergies, they usually default that and bring it right in. 
because allergies don't usually change. And then the pulse form, if they have, if there is a pulse form, a proper EPCR will automatically attach that without them doing anything. Was that clear? Yes. Uh, so I think um, in the diagram here then, where we utilize the medical summary to treat the patient, we, we might be able to um, put something in here that indicates <clears throat> the import of certain information from the medical summaries into um, the EMS provider's report. Uh, that's a step that, that we could probably add there. Yeah, specifically in SAFER, we made those discrete data elements. So every problem that came over is a uh, discrete problem. But even if you brought the whole problem list over as a text blob, that's that's sufficient for them to quickly review and figure out what's going on. Yeah, some of them have medication lists of 85 meds, um, but they're usually in chronological order. So you kind of assume the ones that have been filled recently are the ones that are there. Sorry, the ones that had been prescribed recently filled with a <laughs> different subject. Okay, thanks. Uh, Neil? Good afternoon, all. So uh, I actually want to chime in a little bit. I'm I split the difference here, I think, with this group. I'm an active paramedic, and I have a technical background. So as a paramedic, I find all the, the items Mark identified as very important. Um, I will tell you that what I have seen over our service is we've flushed out our internal databases, that as we use it more, the staff is going to be much more trusting of it. And if I receive a med list, I'm not, I will do a quick reconciliation, but I'm not going item by item to determine it. And if we're utilizing the HIEs to say, feed from their healthcare providers, from the pharmacies of what their active medications are, I'm not sure it's going to be as lengthy a process in verification, especially in high acuity patients. Mm. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and Neil, I think we're saying the same thing is that they want a list, you want a list, take a quick look at it, helps you in your interviewing process with the patient. But not the Bible of everything that's going on. Correct. And Josh, if you don't mind, if I can just chime in with one additional observation on the next bullet point uh, while I have the floor, if you're okay yes. with that. Yeah, which one? For number eight. Number eight, okay. Um, so yeah, actually let's, uh, if you don't mind, I wanna pause for a second and see if we have some more comments on on the medical history, would that be okay? Yeah, there was a, a comment from Kashif uh, in the chat too, or a question. Uh, Oh yeah, let's take a look at Kashif's question. Um, oh, you got a lot in there, Kashif. Okay, let's see. Um, use case 1A, there is reference to the, finding the best medical summary. And then in the use case one process flow diagram at the bottom of the page, there's reference again to freshest or best entry from available document entries. Um, I'm clear on finding the freshest entry, that's the most recent, um, but the question is, can we clarify how we would determine which is the best medical summary? Okay, yeah. Any thoughts specifically on, on, on Kashif's um, question? Sorry, Jonathan, I know you have your hand up, but I wanted to see if anyone has specific uh, or comments specifically on Kashif's question. Yeah, this is John. I, uh, even getting the freshest isn't all that obvious. I'll, I'll mm -hmm. you know, um, in that. So first off, and, and Mark's list is is very useful as well. Um, it's the reason why we're looking for quote medical summary, because the medical summary is supposed to be only uh, the the freshest of information that that organization knows now. What uh, Kasif is pointing out is you know, have to kind of know which organization has the freshest of data um, because you know you kind of need to you don't want to you don't want to pull a medical summary from uh, an organization that hasn't seen the patient for 25 years. Uh, you want to you know pull a medical summary from the where the patient was last uh, seen, and that is not um, always obvious. Um, there, there have been some uh, discussions around, well, you can look at the, the dates of the medical summaries uh, that are there and see which ones have been uh, freshest created. 
Um, there is some current discussion going on um, about a way to keep the metadata, the, the XDS metadata, uh, up to date with a value that is, well, I have information that is no, well, is, is at least this old. So you could theoretically look across the on-demand document entries. Maybe you've got 20 of them. You could look at that metadata element and say, oh, this one has uh, data that, that's more fresh than anybody else. Um, but that's not today all that uh, common, but it certainly is something that has uh, uh, been brought to us by the, the nationwide exchanges, by, by air quality um, and, and e-health exchange, because they're, they're finding that uh, some of the consuming sides are asking for medical summaries, not knowing that there actually isn't anything new uh, available and, and the medical summary that they just asked for and that they now have to process is no different than the one they got, you know, last month. So uh, to, to Kasha's point, that, that's a very, uh, uh, very important and it's good to have, you know, your, your interest there as well. I will point out um, uh, just a, a little clarity, Josh, on your discussion around uh, CCD, CCDA, and, and CDA. C CDA is, is the standard. Um, CDA is, is, is just simply a way to make a document that is an XML form and has uh, well-structured stuff. Um, CCD was just one of the first uh, uh, medical summaries that was pretty widely understood. Um, it was uh, known within IEG as IEG XPHR, which is why that one's also on the screen. It was also known within HITSPE as C32. Um, so C32 could be put on here, but it's the same thing as XPHR, which is the same thing as CCD. Those are just earlier versions of the specification. The, the consolidated CDA uh, was a joint work between IEG and HL7 and uh, ONC predecessor to update the, the specification because people had realized, hey, you know, the CCD uh, spec is okay, but it's missing this clarification or it's missing uh, an update to the vocabulary. So consolidated CEA is, is a joint work um, to, to, to bring some modernization to it. And consolidated CDA has revised a couple of times as well. And there's even companion guides to the consolidated CDA that further refine it. So, you know, all of this is not helping uh, you guys understand how stable things are, but for the most part, all of these little tweaks from the CD, CCDA times up to the current consolidated CDA with the current guidance, fundamentally nothing uh, in the area of medications, allergies, problems really has changed. Um, at best, you, you've got some requirements to, well, you must use uh, you know, uh, this version of, of the vocabulary uh, versus the previous one used in earlier version. So it, it's certainly better, but it's not fundamentally different. If you if you only knew how to process a, a modern consolidated CDA, you would probably be able to process an old C32 um, for the things that you're looking for. Um, and then I'll point out that there's this IPS, which is uh, an, an international patient summary. Uh, there is a CDA version of that as well. Um, it's very similar to, to consolidated CDA, but there's also a fire version of that just to, to throw out yet more options to choose from. But the idea is um, here, it's probably best that the consuming side uh, be able to deal with these four or five different flavors because the variations are not as important as getting the data. Um, but there are specs. It's not hard to 
find um, them. We have plenty of examples uh, of each of them so you can test your code to see whether it can handle the variations. Thanks. Yeah, great, great information. Thank you. Okay, any other comments on this, um, you know, these steps we've covered so far of, of getting the patients, getting some, some medical history about the patient and, and utilizing that uh, during the EMS call? Uh, Jonathan? Okay, um, so this is a, a bit minor, but I think Mark had mentioned about pulsed. Um, uh -huh. you, Mike, right, Mark? Um, so yeah, just... I mean, not a huge issue for this purpose, but I do want to sort of point out for the record that um, DNR, advanced directive, pulsed, most, et cetera, are not the same. Um, and some states make a distinction of that. Uh, so again, if you're looking at uh, a broad applicability of these approaches, the idea, of course, as, as simple as distinct, um, distinguishing a medical order from a legal order. Uh, and in some states, those are intermingled uh, in the same database. And in some cases, they are very much not. Uh, so to the degree that um, that may be something worth putting on here is, again, if you're looking at a patient's medical history and you're looking at an advanced directive, which may be in their legal bucket, um, should that be in the same reference location? Uh, should that be identified differently as something that may be considered but may not be considered a medical item? Uh, I think you, you end up in a little bit of a, of a, of a rabbit hole, um, but because the laws are distinct in that way, it seems at least making sure that we are not painting too broad a brush such that a place that is using an advanced directive registry versus a pulse registry would not say this can't be used here or this uh, can't be used you know, in the other place because it's too broad. Okay, thanks. Yeah, Mark? Yeah, the paramedics in the interview were very clear. They do not want advanced directive. They want things that are physician orders because those are the only things that they are allowed to uh, work off of. And if there's any question, they have a physician they can call and double check if they should use it or not. Yeah, like I said, this is just it's a it's a pretty rapidly moving area right now. Um, there's some legislation in a variety of places. I won't be too specific for, for now. I don't want to overspeak, but, um, depending on when those conversations took place, Mark, I certainly would agree with you. I think that, uh, again, there are, there are places trying to narrow the focus. Um, but there are, again, there are some databases tied in with health information exchanges, what they're actually calling themselves, um, where they are presently commingling the two. Uh, so you'd essentially log into a system see either an advanced directive or a pulsed or some other version um, there in those contexts, you'd need to know what to pull out. Right. So the identification, I think starts to matter a lot more in those places where they may be back building the distinctions because they weren't as clear upfront as opposed to places, uh, Oregon as an example, where there is not a single advanced directive in the pulsed registry. It is only for pulsed. Um, so, um, yeah, I, that I, I think we're probably going in the direction that you just described, but the status quo is not there uh, everywhere. So let's just be cognizant of the fact that some places may look at that and say, we need to do work on our side in order to separate out the two types of documents, in some cases more than two types. Um, but again, you mentioned DNR. That, that was kind of what triggered me here is the the pulse can have a lot more on it than, than DNR. Um, yeah, I was trying, I was trying to, I was trying to use D DNR because some people don't know pulse. And yeah, pulse no, I, I agree completely. Like I said, I think that's why this gets nuanced, right? Because that medical history and, and the, and the orders, uh, and there's a new form that's coming out by the way, 2023 has a change to the, to the pulse. Um, so the, uh, uh, to the degree that, that it's not a binary choice. <laughs> And I think that makes mm -hmm. th it makes it more nuanced to make sure we're looking at something that doesn't just say do X or Y, but can have a variety of instructions along with it. And to the point of other context that's there, whether it's uh, health history or what medications should be administered or not, intubation, yes or no, sort of all these different things, um, we need to find a place to pull that information out and place it on screen as rapidly as you described the clinicians are going to want it. 
Mm-hmm. It, it gets pretty, pretty detailed pretty fast. Yeah. Uh, Neil? So the one thing I'll add is that uh, to, I know Mark said paramedics don't want the advanced directives. That is going to be regionally based. So in my territory, our EMTs can only honor a DNR or a post. Our paramedics do have the flexibility to uh, try, attempt to negotiate through an honor and advanced directive. So as much as we want to limit it, you have to be cognizant that across the country, there's going to be wide variability of what can be recognized in the pre-hospital field. That's precisely my point. Um, so thank you for that. Yeah, that, that, and that's all I'm saying is that I think we... It, this is not something where if, if it were up to me and, and, and I had been at the very early stages of deciding what these documents were, I probably would have done it with less variability than exists. Uh, but the reality is that ex- that variability does exist. And unless and until they get streamlined, which, again, there is a national movement to try to streamline them, uh, that's moving in parallel with this. But, but it's not done. Yeah. So for the purposes of this sequence diagram, we can acknowledge that um, the uh, that. EMS would want to have access to information about orders or something, you know, related that's going to impact what care they provide to that patient. And those may come in different flavors in different jurisdictions, but that that we can acknowledge that they exist and would be relevant to EMS. Um, Mark? Um, well, just, I'm just telling you, the paramedics that I worked with, like a thousand of them, said, unless it's signed by a physician, everything else is just informational. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think at yeah. least in the sequence diagram that we can, we can acknowledge that there's gonna be some document, right? And, and the legal status of that document might be outside of our technical scope um, and, and yeah. might vary from state to state, but we know it's, good, it's something that is of interest to EMS. Well, Josh, let me, let me add on to what Mark said. I think he's right. Um, and, I, I think it, it's again. It if if the point is that there's a document, sure, then I'll give you certainly give it to you. But there are cases where an individual may have an advanced directive and a post, right? And so to, to uh, yeah, I think I think Mark's point is worth harping on a little bit here because the the question of which one to serve up if you have both, which one is noise and which one is not. Um, you know, again, if, if all you're saying is that there's an exchange of some information or a provision of a document, fine. But but again, there's you may be inclined at that point because it was mentioned earlier with respect to medications. Um, you know, me- medication lists are a funny thing. The thing that you see, someone someone said that the, the current list or the, the newest list is most current. But you know, I think about like my dad has been on some medications for 15 years. The the you know, the prescription may be very old and just being refilled because it's insulin. Right. So, um, you know, it, it sort of becomes a question of, um, uh, of yes, the concept is certainly sound that you're mentioning, but the implementation gets very detailed. And so making sure that if you have a choice of one, two, three, five documents, that the one that is needs to be appropriately tagged is the one that's the medical order. Then we need to be able to define what's a medical order and, uh, to the other, you know, we need to define what in each jurisdiction, if a jurisdiction is restricted or they don't use a pulsed, for example, because they don't call it a pulse, they call it a most, and it has different things on it. We need to not cross that line unintentionally. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it just becomes sub bullets to your point about a document. But again, if once yeah. you're going to implement them, then, then we need to start making sure that all the appropriate uh, metadata, et cetera, identifications are part of that process especially when they're changing in parallel to this effort. Yeah, great. Thank you. Uh, John Murky, over to you. Sure, Tom. So this is a fantastic discussion. Uh, there, there are some uh, post uh, specifications uh, in, in CDA. Um, certainly they can also, the, these network exchanges can handle PDFs. Um, I, I did not find MOLT yet, but I, I just wasn't uh, uh, able to, to search for it. I will say that this consolidated CDA does have an advanced directive section uh, that's optional, uh, clearly. So I think the, what this might bring up is there may, may need to be some alternate flows here where, uh, depending on your uh, your your ambulance needs whether you you need to get an advanced directive or you need to get a pulse or you need to get a mulse you you might need to then 
search for those as independent of just getting the medical summary. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was only doing the medical summary because that's all I knew you needed. Um, but adding in these others would certainly be done. I, I'm not confident at all that any of them are actually published through a, a you know any of the flavors of information exchange. Um, so I think that may be a separatable thing, and, and maybe you know should be put up as as a work uh, item to get through. Yeah. Okay. Great. Because my next question was going to be, well, do we have existing standards for um, for these types of documents? So it sounds like um, there's some stuff in uh, like a Polston CDA, uh, obviously, as you say, an unstructured document, just a PDF, um, and then the advanced directive section in the CCDA. Um, but it, we need to figure out if if that stuff's actually present and available in these networks. Is that exactly that yeah. it, okay. The standards that exist, whether they're used, is unknown, and whether they're commonly used, you know, because there's a difference between oh you know, yeah, one organization, uh, you know, has these available, but no one else does. Well, then, you, know, you really have anything? So yeah, I, I, it, that may just be something that's. Um, not mature enough and maybe it's not mature enough because you know there isn't a call to retrieve them if you guys need them that's a call for to retrieve them and you know you might be uh causing the demand so uh, that that may be a, an important thing to bring forward thanks yeah thanks okay i, I want to move on to the next phase i do see bill clark has a comment so go ahead bill and then i want to start jumping into um what ems is going to send over to the hospital Bill? Yeah, sorry, le least technical guy on the phone here, but uh, <laughs> um, from from my perspective as a as paramedic, um, just having a trigger saying that the document exists and not necessarily having it, you know, popped up within the system might be a, a, at least a, a minimum standard or a nice standard to know that, yes, this document does exist. And then we could ask the family or somebody else, you know, to produce the actual document. Um, but just having that trigger would be nice. Okay, yeah. All right, so let's look at, um, so EMS is going to start treating the patient. Um, and in our ideal world now, they have some of the patient's medical history, and that can help them as they treat the patient. And then the next step we have here, number eight, is to push the transport summary to the um, hospital. And I have a few questions um, that I would uh, appreciate input from the group on as we look at, um, at this uh, stage of things, um, and also kind of keeping in mind that at least in the diagram, the way it's drawn right now, this is before they drop the patient off at the emergency department. That might be up for discussion. Um, in in the interactions that I've seen, um, you know, we saw this in the interoperability showcase demo uh, at HIMS. We also saw it in the safer model. Um, there were actually multiple communications going on between EMS and hospital, uh, such as um, notifying the hospital of an incoming stroke patient or, you know, some kind of specialty need patient um, or uh, um, activating, you know, the hospital or sending uh, EKGs to the hospital or some kind of, you know, imaging or, or um, uh something that had been acquired by EMS that needed to be shared with the hospital that wasn't necessarily the full patient care report. Um, so uh, let's dive into this one a little bit. Uh, what would you all recommend in terms of, uh, you know, does this look good or do we need to add some things in here uh, about what EMS is going to be sending to the hospital? So Neil? So thank you, Joshua. This was kind of what I was looking at before. So as a field provider, when I'm going to the hospital, I'm not completing my chart prior to patient transfer, especially with electronic charting. Even with this HIE information coming in, it's not going to be done. What I would, in an ideal world, I would see a push that links to the hospital medical record that says, hey, EMS agency 123 is bringing in a patient, does an initial pre-registration. So it helps expedite the registration process with the demographic information we currently have that they can then reconcile in their system we drop off the patient and then after we leave, then we have the ability to reconcile the patient and our chart is completely gets pushed over to the hospital system. And then additionally, beyond that, other information could flow through based off of admit discharge, where they move in the hospital, et cetera. 
Great, thank you. Uh, Mark? Uh, there's a step missing, which is the paramedic decides the destination hospital. Okay. And then depending on what the system is with SAFER, they are actually streaming data from the EPCR to the hospital um, in route. And, um, and some don't, they wait until the end and do their charting there. But the value to the hospital is the streaming. And the technical people have told me not to use streaming because it's actually <laughs> doing a polling every seven seconds and then sending things. But oh, okay. I'm sorry, that's as close to streaming as I'm going to get. Actually, Mark, Mark uh, streaming also has an FDA uh, uh, implication. That that's actually an important legal distinction. So, okay, Very not nice. just a, yep. Yeah. Okay, uh, Mario. Yeah, I think a couple things. Um, I echo what uh, Neil mentioned. Um, you know, I think we making a distinction between routine cases and acute emergency, like STEMI and those kind of things, um, is important because what we see, especially with the acute cases where this clinical summary is going to be even more valuable, um, is we don't really see EMS doing a lot of charting in real time. They're hands-on with the patient in the back of a moving vehicle. Um, so I think that's one thing. They typically are using a monitor. Um, and that's where, like, if we're talking about raw data, that's where a lot of the, the most valuable raw data is. And, and then the narrative, which again, is probably not even in the PCR app yet. It's in the, it's in the medic's mind <laughs> um, and maybe being spoken aloud to somebody. Um, so I think that's, uh, that's the one aspect to think about. The flow, I think is fine. I think these are kind of the things to, the things to think about and incorporate into the flow. Um, the second is that, you know, pushing a clinical care summary, essentially put, pushing a draft of the PCR at any given point um, is relatively easy. Um, the challenge is going to be uh, having the hospital actually process that into a proactive alert, uh, a pre-admit, a quick reg event uh, in the hospital. Um, you know, Neil comes from a hospital owned EMS. <laughs> so in his case, there's already a trust relationship there, but a lot of times for that to happen, there needs to be a trust relationship established. And I think Mark, that's, you know, that's probably one of the, one of the very valuable things you've done in California is build that, you know, help build that trust relationship. So hospitals are saying, yeah, okay, I will, I will ingest that. <laughs> I will yeah. do that and 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 do something with that patient as opposed to as opposed to just I'm getting something from EMS. Why should why should I why shouldn't I just wait till they get here? Yeah, that's right, Mario. It, with Safer, we're actually incorporating it right into the um, EMR, so the data shows up uh, where it's supposed to show up. So an EKG is going to show up in the EKG tab uh, document. Months, but it's all pre-hospital, so they know it's pre-hospital. What they act on it is your point is whether they trust that data or not. Um, and just, Mario, to follow up, the, the three pieces of information that uh, is being streamed down from uh, right now is the narrative, vital signs, and EKGs. So those are the three pieces of information that have been, been incorporated that go into the EMR. And are you are you finding that that's actually being charted before before they arrive? Yeah, yeah. For yeah, instance, good, good. The, the vital signs in some of the hospitals, because it's discrete, is going not only into the vital signs but into the vital sign flow sheet. Yeah, so that the hospitals are able to look at the vitals pre-hospital and after admission. Nice. Great, I'm taking lots of notes. <laughs> uh, John Murky, question for you. Um, do we have uh, existing standards that can be that we can reference? Um, well, I, I mean, I suppose the answer is yes. I know uh, Mark has referenced those in Safer. You know, so we can say like, well, if you're sending an EKG and that's all you're sending, 
um, that there's a standard that, for that or a set of vitals or a narrative? Um, I think, well, it's hard for me to say anything other than, you know, a, a blanket, yes, of course. <laughs> yes, for them. Um, but I think if we, if we, if we look to very specific things, uh, it'd be better because then I can say, okay, well, here is, is definitely a spec or here is, well, here's the best, you know, available. Um, you know, I mean, EKGs, we, we, we certainly have a specification for that, but it is a PDF wrapped uh, in a CDA. Um, and, and whether that's what is desired to be pushed or... Uh, you want to push the DICOM uh, definition for an EKG, um, you know, so there's there's also choices as well. Okay. Yeah, and just I... um, in the technical specs that we just posted, uh, we, we try to use standards in every possible, and those three use standards. So basically the narrative, I just call it a big text blob, if you will. Um, the, the vital signs is discrete data, and it and it uses the IHE standards for that. And um, the EKG is, for all intents and purposes, a PDF. Okay, Mario. Yeah, I was I was going to say uh, what you know. There's a lot of different standards, and it depends on what you know what exactly you want to do. Um, a CCDA document is great for having a combination of an embedded PDF, a bunch of discrete data, um, a, you know, a standalone document that somebody can view in, in a, in a viewer, you know, sort of as if it was a web page. Mm -hmm. Some people have trouble ingesting the data. Um, HL7 V2, a lot of folks are, have a lot of talent in their, you know, in their teams on ingesting that. So things like an MDM to deliver a PDF, you know, just a, everybody knows what a PDF is, right? Print the damn file. <laughs> That's all it is. <laughs> um, and ORU is usually pretty good for, um, for sending like discrete data that'll flow right into, right into a flow sheet. It's real, real easy for, for like EHR people to use those. So it's a hodgepodge but certainly a combination of like CDA or whatever three letter acronym, three or four letter acronym we want to use, plus a couple of HL7 V2, specifically MDM and ORU is a real good mix of tools for the tool set. Okay. Yeah, I just, uh, for my purposes, we did something that worked, whether it's the best technology now is to be discussed, but we did try and use standards, which we did. And if people looked at that and see what was done, doesn't mean you have to use it, but at least as a baseline, what did work and has worked for almost seven years now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, great. Uh, other comments on, on this communication going from uh, EMS to the hospital, or really maybe I should say between EMS and the hospital, um, you know, prior to or immediately after dropping off the patient. Any other comments in this area? Okay, let's um, continue on through uh, the diagram here. Oh, you know what? I had one question uh, I wanna cover with everyone. Um, so in this early part of the EMS call, they're doing queries uh, and finding possible documents to, to pull. That makes sense because it's an unexpected, unscheduled 911 call. Um, nobody knew in advance that that patient was going to call 911 that day. And, uh, and then EMS uh, pushes their data to the hospital. Um, and so that would certainly work. Um, are there architectures where... Um, EMS would like publish a document and a hospital would be querying for it is it, it you know I think that the, the thing here is the hospital doesn't know in advance that this patient's coming so EMS notifies them that they're coming but it, it at the technical level it, 
does this work as a push to the hospital? Like all the infrastructure is in place in the various networks that that something can be pushed over to a hospital like that. Um, Josh, sorry, it's Mark. I'm seeming to be talking a lot, but um, <laughs> so when the paramedic defines the destination hospital, it sends a pre-admit message, a standard HL7 pre-admit message, mm -hmm. which then the hospital takes and does pre-admit. That allows the data to flow. That allows orders to be placed. That allows a whole lot of stuff. It's just like if they were pre-admitted any other way. It's just it comes from the ambulance. And at that point, the data can start flowing. Okay. Once the patient arrives, they change the pre-admit to an actual admission, mm -hmm. and they'll do one more double check that the patient matches what they have. have. But remember, all of that matching has been done in step one or step two. Yeah, right. Yep. Okay. All right. So the hospital uh, gets the patient at the ED. They admit the patient. Um, and John has written in step 11 here, admit details, undefined method. Um, John, is there anything you want to try to to flesh out in this step with this group? Uh, yeah, that's a call for, you know, the, the only thing I've ever heard is uh, that, you know, the EMT scribbles something down that the admit <laughs> registration uh, kicked out. So I, I just I think there's an opportunity for us to find something there. That's why it's in red. Okay, so like in a, in today's environment, for example, if if they get a printout of the hospital face sheet, that might have um, an identifier on that face sheet that would then allow EMS later to try to query the outcomes of that patient. And, and we need to figure out how to make that more uh, right. electronic. Right. Okay. Yeah. Neil? So we actually have this functional with our current interface. And what ends up happening is, <clears throat> excuse me, based off of the patient being identified as coming by ambulance, information is shared back to our EMR to include dispo, uh, ER disposition diagnosis, final disposition diagnosis to include if they were discharged to home, skilled nurse facility. And then also we're getting patient movements. So we're able to also drill down even deeper into impacts of care based off of where they end up in that movement. So we're getting a, a fairly robust uh, amount of data. As Mario said, we are a hospital-based system, but this is open to any of our, any users of our, our EMR. Okay, so as we get to this stage then, um... Is, is there a point where the hospital is going to try to send data electronically to the ambulance's um, uh, EPCR system um, directly or via a network? Or are we going to be in a case where uh, essentially we try to get an identifier and then EMS follows up with, with queries you know, to say, hey, has this patient been discharged yet? Uh, so, so with Sorry. safer... With Safer on this, if you've got a uh, John Doe or Jane Doe, which happens more often than we'd like, um, the hospital will figure it out. They'll do what's called a merge, and they'll merge it with, their, if they have a record, they'll merge it with the record they have. And as soon as that merge message done, the demographics are updated, it updates the um, EPCR. So the EPCR is getting all the new data that the hospital decides on that information. So what that does from a workflow perspective is the billing office the next day by getting that and also getting discharge diagnosis, then the billing department uses much fewer phone calls to the hospital to reconcile the data. Most of, a lot of it has been coming over uh, automatically. I don't know the stats on that anymore, but. Um, it works pretty well. Okay. And taking a standard case where the patient's identity was already accurate from the beginning, um, then what you're saying is that in the safer model, the hospital is pushing data that's destined for the ambulance uh, company's PCR system. That's correct. It's all done in the background. So as soon okay. as somebody updates the demographic, it just triggers a, a message out. And that's pushing to the HIE, and then the HIE is pushing it to the EPCR? Yeah, the it's, it's actually pushing it to the small piece of 
separate software uh -huh. called the EMS connector, which then puts, pushes it. The only thing that gets in the HIE is, is kind of like a final report, but I will tell you that's the weakest part of, um, of the system. Uh, we focused on getting the stuff back to the EPCR because that's what mattered to the agency. Okay, yeah. Um, uh, Neil, I think you may have had an additional yeah. comment. Yeah, I did. So uh, similar to what Mark was saying is we do get pushes, but we also get that for the John Doe, Jane Doe type patients. And when we were, we are guiding our crews to get an account number information from the hospital, which then allows them to link it so that it's not a after the fact search and figure out how many unknown patients they had at a certain period of time. It's patients register. We're getting that discrete information. And in a future state, if we're pushing a pre-admit to the hospital, they can already utilize it. So it's already going to be linked. Yeah, and that's what I have in the red there. The John Jane Doe handling, yeah. But in the standard case where the patient was pre-identified. Yeah, you already have the ID. You don't need to don't need to be given a temporary ID. You've got the ID. Yeah. So um, where does that come into play in our overall sequence? At, at what point does Step EMS one. obtain that identifier? Step one. Patient look yeah, up. So, yeah, and then from there on down, you're using the ID. Okay. And yeah. So we get patient uh, matches. You didn't, you didn't find a patient. You don't. You know. You didn't have looked up information. You obviously didn't get the medical summary. You didn't have a patient. So. With the Jane Doe, you're just you you arrive at at step nine to start. So right. I, I would push back on that and say that not all patients are going to be available depending on the nature of the call. I mean, I get the information from the search, so it's not going to be an automatic that they jump to it. One, two, it's also assuming that the hospital is utilizing the same identifier for matching. So they may be using an internal identifier as opposed to the HIE identifier. So you still have to be considered that you may have to match further down this sequence. Yeah, so the identifiers that come the, here, the oh, go ahead, John. Is that at, at, at the exchange level, whether it's a, a regional exchange or a national exchange, there is a, a regional or national ID. It is, of course, matched to, to a, an MRN within any particular organization, but that's an organization concern, not uh, not one that, that you have to flow up, but I definitely agree. Um, there's all kinds of IDs. Hmm. So uh, let's take a scenario, if, if this is even realistic, let's say that uh, EMS searches for a patient in a network and they find a patient. So let's say that network has some kind of master patient index and we have a network assigned ID for that patient. So then for the rest of this, and even as, as EMS is sending data to the hospital, they can say, here's the network's assigned ID to that patient. The hospital, theoretically, if they have any in internal identifiers for that patient, they should have some mapping to the ID that has been assigned by the network for that patient and be able to, to know who that is within their, their hospital system. Would that be accurate so far or not? Yes. Yes. Okay, Mario, and, and you would still use that same uh, ID down trying to pull the discharge summary. Okay, I mean that that's that's what the patient identity cross referencing is all for. Okay, yeah, Mario. Yeah, I was gonna I was gonna say you know uh, I think similar but not identical to. John's answer, um, you know, what you described, does that always happen if you have the, like that external ID? Um, I'd say the answer is probably ish, as opposed to <laughs> just a straight, yeah. <laughs> uh, this is, and I think this is why one of the, one of the meeting agenda topics is patient, patient matching yeah. is, a, is a specific meeting topic, which I sh I'm sure we'll dive into, is that sometimes one through, what is it, seven, doesn't even happen or isn't very successful at all. Um, and again, unfortunately, it's the higher criticality ones where where you have that have that gap. Um, and sometimes the 
you know, like, like Mark said, you want to do whatever, you know, we want to be, we want to use standards. We want to drive standards. The reality of what's in the wild right now is that sometimes that doesn't, that doesn't really work. Sometimes you have to have that MRN and oftentimes you have to have that, that CSN or, you know, like, or to use, <laughs> to use more lay terminology, the lifetime patient identifier at that healthcare org and the specific encounter ID at that healthcare org. Other, otherwise, it requires a manual step um, in the facility as opposed to just, oh, it's, it's there in the patient chart. Okay, so I think what I'm hearing is in an ideal scenario, we have an identifier for that patient signed by the network and we use that throughout the rest of the exchange. In the uh, real world, that might happen, or it might be that we go through a lot of these steps not having yet gotten that, that uh, kind of global or, or at least network identifier for the patient. We've still taken them to the hospital. And so at that point, that's kind of our, if we don't, if, if we don't have the ID yet, then this is where we need to get an ID from the hospital that they've assigned to that admission. Is that kind of what you're saying, Mario? Oops, sorry, I was on mute. Um, yeah, yeah, that, that, yeah, there's that optimal flow, but there is a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of edge cases. Yeah, okay. If the the okay. red box is probably being overly constrained to John and Jane Doe. It, it could just simply be, uh, someone who the ambulance has well identified, but they just weren't able to find a definitive ID for. So I agree, you know, mm -hmm. you know, some patients, uh, you know, happen to use, uh, uh, you know, names that are not formally recognized until you finally drill down and find, oh, this is actually what, you know, so I, I agree that's a little bit more fuzzy. And yeah, the temporary ID is probably, as Mark pointed out earlier, um, assigned possibly by the, the, the ambulance prior to sending any information to the hospital. So maybe it's it's not exactly situated on the on the chart here in the best place. So Josh, I, I'm I'm sorry, I even hate to bring this up, but, but I would be remiss if I did not. These are these are the kind of the standard workflows that we're going through here. Uh, when implementing, there's a lot of hospitals that have a separate trauma workflow where mm -hmm. they're assigning all sorts of numbers and reconciling things later. Uh, that proved to be quite a difference. And uh, hospitals did one of two things. One is they kept the old system, which created more work when SAFER was implemented. Other ones, um, Rady Children's Hospital in San Diego and Stanford decided to redo their entire trauma workflow, which required them adding almost 30% more effort hours to implement. But they got a lot of benefits by redoing their trauma, not just for SAFER. And uh, then the SAFER could work for trauma and non-trauma patients. So there's Probably some note here we have to <laughs> say it says if trauma patient, <laughs> go have a cup of coffee or something. <laughs> yeah, and those trauma bands and everything. Yeah. Uh, Mario, did you have another comment on that? Oh, no, sorry. I forgot to lower okay. my hand. No problem. All right. So um, hopefully at this point, we have an identifier for the patient assigned by the network, possibly a, a, an identifier that came from the hospital. Um, for, for this visit. Um, and then we've got a couple options here that John has outlined for actually getting the hospital discharge summary. So one being a subscribe, if the HIE supports that model, uh, the EMS software can say, hey, when it's available, give me a discharge summary for this patient. Um, or the polling where it says, hey, is a discharge summary available for this patient? And it gets a yes or a no, and it, and it just pulls periodically um, until yes, a discharge summary is available. Um, so I, uh, that's the two there. I don't know, John, anything you would, you would wanna fill us in on and on kind of those options? 
Um, the subscribe is, is, I put it in there because some people have a, a guttural uh, dislike for polling, but effectively, it's already been said earlier, you, you tend to poll. Um, subscribe is really also only available with XDS, uh, so it's only going to work if you have a regional. Um, but ultimately, it, subscription doesn't actually save you a whole heck of a lot. Um, so essentially, if you if you go to the, the polling section, you're doing a query for documents just like you were above, except you're looking for discharge summaries. And and there's a few flavors of discharge summary rather similar to medical summaries. Um, discharge summaries are uh, something we do see on the nationwide exchange uh, along with medical summaries. So those two things are, are pretty common there. Um, so it should be findable. Uh, when, when the patient is discharged. Um, whether that fully meets your needs, I, I really can't evaluate. I, I, I put this in here because I was told you guys needed a discharge summary in order to fill up the Nemesis uh, PCR, but I, I'm not even sure whether um, that's the only thing you need or whether there's other things you might need to query for and retrieve as well. Yeah, I think the key elements there are the diagnoses that that patient had and and where they went. You know, their hospital discharge disposition. Um, uh, is that a question for the group? Is that um, sufficient to get that discharge summary? Are there other documents that you think are important to get after the EMS call has finished? I'll just go with what I said previously. We're receiving a floor movements and things like that that help give us additional insight as to what happened oh. to the patient. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I'm not sure whether those are typically included in discharge summaries. Um, I'm not aware of those kinds of things uh, flowing through a nationwide exchange. It's certainly a flow if you have a direct connection to an ADT or you know to an HL seven B two feed, but that's not a not a common nationwide solution. And to, mm -hmm. just to reinforce that discharge summary for some reason uh, was causing problems getting back to the uh, the EPCR. So um, if they needed the discharge summary versus the individual data elements that I put in the PowerPoint, Th those individual data elements, discharge diagnosis, discharge dis disposition, those things come over as discrete things, but the actual discharge summary document for some reason had problems. So that wasn't implemented. I don't think anybody actually implemented getting the uh, formal document back to the EPCR. Hmm. Okay. Hmm. okay. I'm going to write that down to follow up on. So, yeah, we might want to look and see. Because, uh, like I said, discharge summaries are pretty common to be posted. So, yeah, maybe yeah. worth looking at again. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Make sure we uh, can, can really identify. Here's, yeah. Here's the standard that you're going to expect that's going to have the information you need. Um, okay, we're getting near the end of our time. Um, so uh, I want to make sure that we can um, at least kind of have a good closure to this and, and then let you all get on to your next things today. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I think the, so one question I had, which, which I already asked, and maybe we can do a little more research on is um, it sounds like in the safer model, the hospital was pushing um, uh, the data to um, that connector hosted by the HIE. And then that was pushing back to the EPCR system. And in this diagram, we've modeled um, something that's EMS initiated where they're either doing a subscribe or they're polling for that data and waiting, you know, for a response uh, and, and then retrieving that data. So, um, anyway, that might be something for us to work on a little, uh, whether that push approach would be common or not, or whether the polling would, would really be the most common way to go. I don't know if there's any quick thoughts on that or not. 
Hey, Josh, this is Kashif here from Imitrent. Yes. Yeah, for the outcome data for a majority of the implementations that we've done uh, to retrieve that from hospitals and HIEs, and it has primarily been uh, the case where we're getting those through HL7V2ADTs that are uh, being pushed into us based on the discharge events that take place, uh, at 03 being a discharge, 06 of an admin for a patient, uh, ED2 hospital, and a 08 for subsequent uh, discharge uh, messages that take place. Uh, uh, with no two, we in going through the care quality network was an opportunity with the operations query piece that we uh, built up uh, is to go through the polling approach through the care quality network uh, in, in that regards to try to look for the discharge summary document uh, uh, and parsing through that uh, to retrieve and try to map, map, map into the e outcome elements uh, yet to have gone live with that, but we started working on that and building that. Uh, but those are the two it was primarily push uh, is what's coming in with the ADPs into us. Uh, and more question for the folks here, if you go with the polling approach, at what point do you want to stop the polling for the discharge summaries, right? In the sense that you get the discharge summary for uh, a document uh, and uh, the CC, the a type, uh, type document of discharge summary, and you're parsing and getting the e outcome elements. But then if there are subsequent changes later on to the patient record uh, at, at the hospital side, uh, how would those be? recognize in terms of when EMS, EPCR folks are doing the polling approach, because are they stopping right when they get the first discharge summary, or do they continue polling for a little bit longer, and how much longer is ideal? For some patients could be, uh, you know, uh, some changes happen later for some given reason at the hospital, maybe a documentation issue or something like that. Just some thoughts there. In the ADT V2 side, it's easy because the A08s keep coming, pushing over because uh, they made the change, it pushes over, we get it. But in the polling side, if we're polling and we pull the discharge summary, and then we suppose that the EMS, we, we render stop at that point, but then how do you know that you need to pull again for any subsequent changes that have happened, if that makes sense? Exactly, yeah. Uh, anyone have thoughts on that? Or maybe it's something for us to, to put on the, the to-do list to figure out. All right. Okay. So, um, uh, let's see. So uh, then, at, at the the end here, um, extracting some data elements out and getting those into the Nemesis XML. <clears throat> um, so we have some task force. Uh, that's going to be a future task force topic that we'll dive into um, how that data would be processed. Uh, then the final step is actually delivering that Nemesis PCR to the state, which is a process that already happens routinely today. Um, the difference, of course, being that we now have outcome data uh, in that Nemesis XML uh, that goes to the state. And we have in the past talked about some nuances there um, about uh, figuring out what outcome data to put into the Nemesis XML file. Um, if the patient went to multiple hospitals, um, the Nemesis XML only allows for outcomes from one hospital, some, some things that we can uh, still do some work on there to try to flesh that out. But looking at our time, I think we will uh, cut it at that point there. Um, and uh, just uh, want to say thanks to everyone for a great discussion on the call today. I hope that we have um, identified, I know I've got two pages of notes of how we can refine the, the sequence diagram um, and some additional things that we can uh, consider in that diagram. Um, we do have a follow-up poll for uh, all these task force calls, including today's call. It's just a quick four question poll. Um, if you could take a couple minutes after uh, you drop off the call, uh, just in the next few minutes, um, to uh, fill out that poll, we would appreciate it. Um, and Lisa, if you could uh, put that poll link in the chat, that'd be great. Um, we also have the QR code here on the screen. Again, just a quick poll that says, how did we do today? Did we cover the topic uh, thoroughly enough? Do we need more time on it? And um, what's the next most important topic for us to cover in the task force call as we look to um, uh, July? So there's the link uh, that Lisa just put in the chat. 
All right, so next steps, take that survey. Um, uh, as always, there's the email group if you're not already subscribed, um, the uh, GitHub repository and uh, wiki um, includes a link to the sequence diagram that we reviewed today. So we can take a look there. And then uh, July 13th will be our next task force uh, call. Uh, I'll be looking to your survey responses since we only have a couple minutes left here. Um, otherwise, I would I would ask for some verbal comments on what we should focus on uh, on July 13th. I'm kind of thinking about uh, diving into some of the standards that are called out in the sequence diagram and saying, you know, just kind of familiarizing ourselves. So when we say XDS, what is that? Uh, and a little bit of a uh, of a primer on the different standards that are used. Um, so that's what I'm thinking about, but I'd love to hear your uh, comments via the poll uh, so we can uh, plan out the call for July 13th. All right, um, Amit, uh, any parting comments from you? No, just a um, great conversation. Thank you everyone for your contributions. Um, we're looking forward to reconvening everyone next month uh, as part of the Interop Task Force and also be on the lookout for more information for our Path to Production event that will be bookending that task force meeting uh, July 12th and 13th. So more information we'll distribute on our Google groups as well. Thanks, Amit, and thanks, everyone, for a great discussion today. We'll see you next month.